Good morning to you. Here we gather today on Remembrance Sunday. Remembrance Sunday is often a time when actually the church is very busy. Busy with our regular worshippers, but busy also with others who perhaps come for this particular day. Whether in uniform as part of the youth organisations or, or because they feel, well, this is absolutely a time to recognise the, the bonds which unite us and the God who cares for us all. Now that's a, an evangelistic challenge, I, I dare say, for ministers. It's a challenge for all of us, actually, to recognise what it is that makes for peace. Who it is who makes for peace. Here we come to worship God. I encourage you to, to join in with the singing. We've had some songs as ever prepared for, especially for this morning, and very grateful to those who have done the singing in advance, and you might like to join in at home. Our opening hymn is We Sing a Love That Sets Us Free. Let's worship God together. Psalm 37, it says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Let's pray together. And so, Lord, for the love that sets us free, here we come in thankfulness. Thankfulness that you are in our midst, that you watch over us and your world. You see us as we are, you know us in our hearts. Oh Lord, may we worship you. May we give you the praise and the glory. And may we be ready to be emptied of all that would turn us away from that. Of all that would drag us down. Of all that even within us would bring hurt to others thoughts, word, deeds. How conscious we are, Lord, that we live in a world where alongside amazing beauty and astonishing potential, great science, glorious reaches of imagination, of language, of blessing, alongside all of that, there is that capacity to wound and to kill to bring violence, to sow hatred, 
to be unforgiving. And Lord, we are part of this world. We ourselves have been corrupted also. We come to you humbly, seeking your forgiveness and your peace, your guidance and your strength. Above all, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who went even to the cross for us, who died for us, a shameful death, and yet rose again in glory that we might live, live by faith, live with hope, live through love, love that is eternal. And so we pray for your blessing. We pray for your guidance in our lives. We pray for our resolve, our confidence, our willingness to accept all that you give to us, all that you will yet give to us, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to just slightly front load the service uh, in order that we can, I hope, get uh, uh, come to the, the, the remembrance bit of the service around 11 o'clock. And so... We're going to hear now immediately the, the reading, and the, the reading from one of the Old Testament prophets. Um, you know, prophecy is not simply something that belongs to people who have been called prophets with a capital P, but in the Old Testament there are quite a number of prophets, I suppose, with a capital P. And today we're going to the prophet Micah. I've asked uh, Alison to read. Good morning. This morning's reading is from Micah, Micah 6, verses 1 through to 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through to 8. Listen to the Lord's case against Israel. Arise, O Lord, and present your case. Let the mountains and the hills hear what you say. You mountains, you everlasting foundations of the earth, listen to the Lord's case. The Lord has a case against his people. He is going to bring an accusation against Israel. The Lord says, My people, what have I done to you? Have I been a burden to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron and Miriam to lead you. My people, remember what King Balak of Moab planned to do to you and how Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. Remember the things that happened on the way from the camp at Arcasia to Gilgal. Remember these things and you will realise what I did in order to save you. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as an offering to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we have words that have been handed down, now thousands of years old. But for us in this time, Lord, for us in this time, here and now, we hear your word. We come to hear your word to us, to our world. Come in our midst, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When we look back, as people have done, to times of war, in particular to World War I and World War II, there is no doubt that they were world-changing. 
The impact of war was massive in many, many respects, but I would mention, for example, well, the, the redrawing of maps and boundaries and the reinvention of society and indeed church. Europe after World War I and Europe after World War II were different places. Empires had fallen. New states had been created. There had also been a massive economic impact because war is horrendously expensive. And there was social change. Huge shifts had happened with youth work, for example, after the First World War. And for that matter, also very importantly, women getting the vote. And after World War II, the invention of the welfare state and the whole succession of very significant shifts in people's health and standards of living. And there were huge changes in the church as well, because ways of thinking about God had been hugely, hugely affected by the experience of war. In World War I, there had been Christians on opposite sides, rather assuming that God would be with them and not the enemy. And from World War II, there was this awakening, well, not least to the subject that's very much at the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans, which we're reading at the moment in a Bible study. The question, do the Jews matter to God or not? When we look back to times of war, it was world changing. And then for us now, in the midst of it, what is it? Can we compare it to a war, to a world war? Maybe yes, but maybe no. From Corona, there is certainly a huge economic cost. And we are also, I dare say, undergoing a shift in thoughts about how good health can be sustained. And what is this quality of life, which 10 years ago, or even just one year ago, people often define so tightly in material terms. Now people are asking, is being able to fly anywhere in the world cheaply actually that important? Is being able to eat out even as important as being able regularly to see those whom we love and those whom we ought to love? Even that mantra, which was very much a, a World War II thing and has been endlessly repackaged in, 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 in more recent years, keep calm and carry on. We're needing to think about that too, because quite a lot of our carrying on is just not straightforward. Not in working life, not in the church. Now, today we're not in the position of looking back and finding the wisdom of that. But perhaps then it's all the more helpful that we're reading from the Bible today some prophecy. Now, now prophecy isn't just about the future. I, I hope we all know that. But what prophecy nevertheless is about is discerning truth that can take us into the future. Because prophecy does two things. It sounds the warnings, and then, and certainly the book of Micah, from which we've read today, uh, certainly does this, prophecy also lays out a vision. The warnings say what is to stop, and the vision what is to draw us on. What is to stop? Well, in the book of Micah, there's lots about what is to stop, what is not to be done. He was a country lad, as it sometimes says, Micah. But he spoke to two adjoining kingdoms in north and south. Uh, not Scotland and England in his case, uh, but rather the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. <clears throat> and Micah warned against false worship, idols which were sucking up people's energies and devotion. Micah also spoke against... Uh, Inequalities, people not caring about what was happening for those who were most vulnerable and on the edge. 
Micah talked about the parasites of society who were doing anything for themselves and so little for others. He talks about leaders taking bribes, priests charging for their services, and finds that grim. The best of them, he says, is like a briar, the most upright, like a hedge of thorns. 8th century BC, a public commentator saying, what a shower we've got in charge of us. What people like, Micah goes on, is of course somebody who will promise you wine and beer in plenty, who will condone whatever is going on and say still, oh, the Lord is with us, no worries. But Micah says, a war will come. Strife, grief. And Mike admits that he himself is utterly cut up about this. If only these things were not true, he laments. There is so much that should stop. As I say, you know, when we do our looking back, whether it's at World War history or as or some can do at a personal experience, perhaps, of having been near death and then having recovered. Looking back, people do sometimes get clarity on what should stop. But here's the prophet saying with equal force, do it now for the sake of the future. Think about what should stop. Make resolutions, write them down. Talk them through on the phone or, or on Zoom. What should stop? What has to stop? Prophecy sounds out the warnings and then it lays out a vision. In Micah, the vision is of a remnant, a small number of faithful souls who are hanging in there. They might be lame, he observes, some of them using their sticks, not so good on their legs. They might feel like strangers in the world they inhabit because so many don't seem to believe what they believe. They may be people, he says, who know all about suffering. It's not necessarily the case that life will have been easy for them. But that remnant is precious to God. And Micah very famously said that out of Bethlehem, from way out in the sticks, even from there, a king would come. It's a bit of Micah that we very often read around Christmas. And then he also says, there will be a time when swords are beaten into plowshares and nations will train for war no more. Micah has that. And it's God's will to be forgiving, Micah is sure. God's will is to have compassion, he says, to tread our sins underfoot, to hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I'm quoting, and it's a, a beautiful vision that comes out in this book of the prophet Micah. So there's these two strands being done with things that we've allowed to happen all around us and even in us. And on the other, trusting in a God who is and always will be merciful. That's Micah's call for the future, these two strands. And then in chapter 6, with some of what I've quoted coming before it and some of it after it, there is this famous bit which Alison read out for us. And so let's hear this bit. The Lord is amazing, sings the prophet. Have you taken on board, have you remembered, do you remember all that the Lord has done? Now, too obviously, the people of his day seemed not just burdened, but complaining. They were laying blame on the Lord for what was happening in their present. 
I don't think this is at all helpful, reckons Micah. I mean, he hears the people, the, the people of his day, imagining a need for appeasement rituals. What shall I offer? What shall I do? What, what, what do I really need to give the Lord to make him lovely towards us? What do we need to do, say this beleaguered people, to get out of this present crisis? Now, there they were in the 8th century BC, but I think quite a lot of this can absolutely be reimagined for us now, reheard for us now. Sometimes people do ask, what do we need to do? Preferably a minimum that we can get away with. But if necessary, make high, high demands of us so that we can get back to happy, normal times again. That's the spirit here. But now let's hear Micah's answer. And some of us might be able even to quote this off by heart. What does the Lord require of you? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. Now, yes, it is about doing Micah's response. He talks about acting justly loving mercy, walking humbly with God. But I want to say it's also really about being. I, I mean, the word of the Lord is not for us to be doing just enough to get us through. It's not just about keeping within the law and ticking off certain boxes. There is a way of living, a way of being, as I'm calling it, which we are at all times and in all places to embody. You see, acting justly has its edge because there always are injustices out there. And we are to be honest. We are to be truth seekers, scrupulously fair, not, not bending rules to, to suit ourselves. Loving mercy, and that always has an edge because we are tempted to be harsh, harsh on others, harsh also sometimes on ourselves. And walking humbly with our God, there is so much for us to learn, not least about faith. You see, Mike is not giving us a recipe as if we can, as it were, whip things up and the cake will come out perfect every time. Uh, if you're watching Bake Off at the moment, you'll appreciate the force of that metaphor. <laughs> Cakes are not that easy to whip up perfectly every time. This here in Micah, and I could take you to similar passages in the prophet Amos or the prophet Isaiah or in the Psalms or above all, actually, in Jesus of Nazareth. What he's saying is about life in its fullness. You and I needing to see the hurt that is around us. You and I needing to see the, the damage that is within us, within us. And then you and I needing to see the Lord, who we may imagine to be judging us from a distance, but in fact, the Lord is alongside us, showing us the way, taking us by the hand, leading us into life as it should be, You see, what to do is not the only question. It's who to go to, who to accompany us, who to trust our life, our loved ones, our nation to. That is every bit as much the thing. We look forward in faith. Shall we sing together?
Because of the gun ceasing on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, the, the ritual of remembering around that day, and especially on the Sunday in the years that day, was begun. Now, it may be strange, you think, to be going through a ritual act immediately on the back of the prophet Micah, but Micah was not saying, was not saying that ritual acts are worthless. His point was that in our rituals, even in our more serious rituals, there is much more that should undergird this. Our integrity, our full humanity should be committed at all times and in all places. And so as today we meet in the presence of God and commit ourselves to work in penitence and faith for, for reconciliation. Reconciliation, knowing that Christ has reconciled us with God. Reconciliation in a world where nations still are at war with one another. We pray that people will learn to live together in freedom and justice and peace. So we're going to take a time of silence we should pray for all who are knowing bereavement and disability and pain after fighting and terror. We should remember with thanksgiving and sorrow those whose lives in world wars and conflicts past and present have been given and taken away. And this poem is always remembered. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn, at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. I would invite you, if you feel able, now as we take two minutes silence, you might like to stand. O God of truth and justice, 
we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we will never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish us harm. As we honour the past, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope, now and forever. Amen. Would you like to, to sit again? And let's continue in some prayers, shall we? Let's, let's pray again. Oh Lord, we bring our prayers around all who have suffered as a result of conflict. As today we think of the service given by men and women in the violence of war and of those who have loved and lost. We think too of civilian women, children and men whose lives have been or still are disfigured by war or terror. In penitence we call to mind the anger and hatreds of humanity. Lord, grant us your peace. And then, Lord, we pray for all who through their work are in danger this day. All who are in the front line, literally or metaphorically. And we remember too their families and friends. We pray for all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military and religious. Asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve so as to do well what is within our powers. We think of Her Majesty the Queen, all the way through to the little child who will give the lead. Lord, anchor us in hope. We pray today for peacemakers and peacekeepers, for negotiators, and for all whose work in the background and not in the headlines is vital to the pursuit of justice and the administration of affairs. We give thanks for prophets who raise their bold voices. And we give thanks for all who in their lives take on the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Lord, strengthen us in love. And then thinking of wherever today there is unrest, wherever there is hunger and thirst, wherever there is illness or hurt, wherever there is lack of opportunity or oppression, we pray you, Lord, to make your presence known. For those in hospital, from the tiniest baby to the person at the end of long years, or for those stricken by bereavement and the extra agonies in that experience brought on by the present COVID situation. And indeed for anyone whom we now name in the silence of our hearts. Lord, bring your saving grace. Yours are the words of eternal life. Merciful God, we offer to you the fears in us that have not yet been cast out by love. And may we accept the hope you place in the hearts of your people and live lives of justice courage and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Redeemer, in whose name now together we pray in whatever form we find familiar. Our Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. I'd like to show you just before we sing our final hymn just a few pictures. And um, we uh, have had various things happening in the uh, the two churches where I, I'm the minister. Uh, a collection of of hand painted stones. I'm going to show you those and just mix those with the a few pictures of the war memorials in the churches, which sadly, of course, we're not, we're not able to be in at the moment. So we'll start, uh, this is outside uh, Calder Bank, and some of the children uh, from, actually from the Catholic primary school, coming along with stones, I think, in that picture. Uh, uh, we've been trying to make that for the whole village, and that was certainly the, the collection of stones in progress at that point. Children in the school across the road were also participating. I think I think they were responsible for these uh, hand-painted uh, wreaths that were affixed to the railings. Inside the church, there are two memorials: uh, one for the those who fell in the First World War, and the lectern where the the Bible is placed and where I preach from is the memorial for those who died in the Second World War. In Cairn Lee, of course, we had two church buildings. Uh, the the Broom Knoll building uh, had this war memorial, which will be uh, being uh, reconstructed in the, the new Cairn Lee church, uh, this covering both the First and the Second World War. Also in Broom Knoll, there were two rather fine uh, stained glass windows that were put up after the First World War. And these windows very happily are, are being preserved and will still be visible even after all the reconstruction work that's happening at Broomnall Church. Um, both of them very beautiful and uh, work from 1929. In the church that used to be called Flower Hill, uh, the other part of Cairn Lee, uh, there was this little memorial chapel with the uh, war memorial uh, uh, in marble uh, stone on, on, on the right hand wall you can see and then on the left a uh, stained glass window this time commemorating people from the Second World War it's uh, I think in the 1950s this window was was painted. And then also at Cairn Lee we had children uh, bringing their painted stones uh, in this case from Tolbury Primary School and uh, adding them to those that have been painted by some of the congregation, and uh, I don't think I could get them all in one picture. Uh, it's quite a lot of the stories altogether, uh, and I think there may even be more now since these photographs were taken. And so we've been trying to mark Remembrance Sunday in these different ways. We are apart, and yet we are together. We have a common faith. And maybe just one last thing to say before we, we sing our last hymn. Um, I know people have been very kindly commenting on, on, on the wonderful flowers that seem to accompany me most of these Sundays. That's uh, nearly always due to my wife, although uh, very happily, of course, uh, there have been one or two people very kindly uh, uh, giving us flowers to help. And uh, uh, these flowers today and uh, uh, the, the arrangement uh, have come from the flower basket. Just, just they decided to give us them, which is uh, very, very kind of them. Um, so, uh, yes, it's very interesting, isn't it? Here we come together. Here we come together to be God's people. We may be each of us in our own homes, but we are joined. Joined in what God calls us to, in who God calls us to be together. Shall we sing as our closing hymn, O Church Arise? Another wonderful hymn. If you don't know it, it's a very straightforward tune, so I hope you'll be able to pick it up. Say that there's strong in the strength. 
And so, be blessed, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you evermore. Amen.